very grateful and very thankful. God bless you. Bless you, Rich. Thanks, Rich. Bless you. So, yeah, the most unassuming of guys <laughs> doing an incredible work. And when I visited Rich last year, um, I met some of the guys who were in the program. One of them, I forget, is he had kind of a nickname, and he was given the nickname because what he had done was he killed people and chopped them up. It's a rough place to be. Uh, and Rich went down there years ago, uh, kind of with nothing, to just see what God would lead him into. And now he has uh, been directing for years this drug rehab center right in the center of Guatemala City. And as he said, uh, we became aware last year that um, their main source of funding had dried up. And we were in a position, because you're so generous with our missions offering the first Sunday of each month, we were in a position to significantly increase what we were able to send to Rich. And as he told me uh, recently, he said, basically, Genesis is keeping this ministry going. So while we're doing this here, we are actually making a significant uh, contribution to a drug rehab center in the middle of hell. So thank you. God bless you. So we're going to pray, and then we're going to come to today's teaching, okay? Father, thank you for the opportunity to come together and, Lord, just to breathe and let go of things and focus on you. Thank you for the just sense of your presence here today. And, Lord, as we look at your word, I pray you'd speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. So, We've been looking at a teaching series called But God, and we've looked at a number of passages in the Bible where it describes something and it says, But God. And today, um, I want to come into the last part of that, but before, before we do, uh, the next two Sundays, we're going to do a short series called Let Down. The subtitle is Dealing with Disappointment. And what I want to do is next week, I want to look at what the Bible says that would help us in dealing with disappointment with other people. When people disappoint us in life, what's there in the Bible to help us deal with that? And then the following week, I want to deal with being disappointed with God. No, you've ever been there, right? Okay, so that's good. But what do you do when you feel God let you down? And uh, I'm going to talk about that two weeks' time, okay? But, but today we're going to talk about... Uh, but God, I was I was reading a um, I was reading an interesting article, and it was um, a hospice uh, was or a counselor from a hospice was asked to talk to some children, and to to try to kind of get them more comfortable with with death, and um, the report on that was carried in a in a British newspaper recently. And, and some of the, some interest kids say the most fascinating things, don't they? I, I mean, like you can tell them what to say, but you can't guarantee what's going to come out of their mouths, right? So, one child said, "You turn into a skeleton and you never come back alive." I guess they got the kind of direct version from their parents, right? Some said you go to sleep. Another said you turn into sand for a hundred years and you won't get back no more. Then they asked the children, but where do you go? Somebody said you go into the sky and the stars and you sit on a star. A little girl said, my two grandpas are sitting on them already. But then there was another one who said, well, you don't always have to. My cat died and she's just in a jar now. And then another girl said, well, you go to the hospital for a long time, then you get buried, then you're happy under there because your garden is on top of you. <laughs> the, the last question they were asked was, what is it like when you die? Someone said, you turn into an angel with very pretty wings. And so another little girl added, and they got sparkles. 
and God is a boy with a nice white shirt. Another girl said, well, you have to go up to the angels and then we come back down when we're alive again. And then there was the boy who said, well, maybe they're allowed to touch lava because they're dead. You know, the kid said, how are you going to touch lava from up there? Somebody said, well, it looks like gold there and you see loads of statues. And then there was a little boy who said, they'll be playing my favorite song, Captain Jake and the Neverland Pirates. <laughs> and then the other one, I think this one was actually really getting down to the nitty gritty of heaven. I think there will be chocolate. <laughs> Everything chocolate and marshmallows. And then there's one child who was alarmingly excited about the prospect of one of their relatives dying because he said, when Poppy dies, I'll be so happy because I don't like her. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We've all been touched by death in different ways. We've all known the incredible the incredible heartbreak and the pain of parting. The Bible refers to death as the last great enemy. But it also says this in the same verse. It said Jesus came to free those who all their lives lived in fear because of death. So part of the mission of Jesus was to remove the fear of death from us. And our last but God in this series is this, but God will take me home. But God will take me home. You see, Psalm 49 in verse 13 says this, it says, this is the fate of those who trust in themselves and of their followers who approve their sayings. They're like sheep and are destined to die. Death will be their shepherd, but the upright will prevail over them in the morning. So it goes on to say of them, their forms will decay in the grave far from their princely mansions. So in other words, people who trust in themselves and don't trust in God it's not the brightest of futures. Because the truth is that part of our development is this. Death is as necessary for our progress as it is for a chick to be hatched or, or for a butterfly to leave a cocoon. To live in the eternal realm, we need to leave the earthly body and we need to receive a spiritual body. Paul talked about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 50. And he says this, he says, I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. So Paul says here in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, look, Everybody is going to die. It's the only way. The only way we can move from this realm to the heavenly realm is there has got to be a transition. There has got to be a transformation. So what is earthly and temporary has to be laid aside in order that we can take on what is heavenly and what is eternal. So, Back in Psalm 49, the psalmist says, here's what's going to happen to those who do not trust in God. But then he goes on and says this in verse 15, but God will redeem me from the realm of the dead. He will surely take me to himself. Now, I don't know about you, I do not relish dying and I have no plans to do it in the immediate future. None of us knows how long this life's going to be. None of us knows what's going to happen in the future. I don't know when the day will come when I leave this earth, but I'll tell you what I do know. I do know that God will redeem me from the realm of the dead, and he will surely take me to himself. That's what I know. 
That's what I know. Dying I don't relish. Death's a different issue altogether because I know what happens then. I know what happens then. God will redeem me from the realm of the dead. He will surely take me to himself. God has redeemed us. When I was uh, a junior in high school, uh, we used to have, we, our church, I lived in a small city. The church was kind of pretty central to the city. And one of the things in the church's program was every, every Monday night from six till seven, we had a children's program. And, and our pastor was, I, I was talking with him one day and he said, it looks like we'll have to shut down the Monday night program because there were just two people running it and neither of them can do it anymore. So here's me, a high school junior. I said, I can do it. Uh, and he said, you really think so? I said, no, I know I can do it. I can do it. So he said, uh, okay, what I want you to do is I want you to sit in for the next couple of weeks and then talk to me again. I talked to him again. I said, I I'll do it. That's fine. I and so for the next year and a half at least, I ran the Monday night program. I had the key. I went down. I opened the church. I set everything up. Kids all came in, used to have 30, 40 kids there from around the area. And, uh, and we did this kids club thing. And every week I gave them a talk and told them a story. Uh, but my repertoire was limited. One of the favorite stories that I drag out now and again, my favorite story was the story of a little boy who built a model boat. And he was so proud of this model boat when he finished it. And he decided now he wanted to watch and see his model boat sail. And he took his model boat down to the edge of the sea and he put it in. And he was so thrilled as he saw it riding the waves. And then suddenly a huge gust of wind came, picked it up and took it way out beyond his reach. And he stood on the shore and he cried because his boat was lost. He was quite unconsolable for a day or two because he'd put so much effort and he loved this boat. It was weeks later that he was passing a, a uh, I don't know what you call them. We call them junk stores. Okay, junk store, we good? Secondhand store, whatever. Thrift shop, okay. <laughs> Sorry, yes, in the 21st century, they're much more sophisticated. He was passing a thrift shop and... <laughs> And his amazement in the window of the thrift shop is his boat. And he couldn't believe it. He rushes in, says to the lady behind the counter, that's my boat in the window. It's my boat. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to have it back. He went and picked up the boat. And she said, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You can't take that boat. You've got to pay for it. And he said, no, you don't understand. I, I, I made it. That is my boat. And she said, no, no, no. You've got to pay for it. And over the next several weeks, he did jobs, he did chores to get the money together until he could go back and buy his boat back. That's what redemption is. That's what God has done for you and me. He made us. We were his because he made us. But then we were lost to him. But when we were lost to him, God paid the price to buy us back. The little boy said when he got his boat, he said to the lady, you know what? This is my boat twice over now because I made it and I've bought it back. God has redeemed everyone who trusts in him. He's made us and he has bought us back. How do I know that God will take me to himself because he has redeemed me. That's what this statement starts with. God will redeem me from the realm of the dead. Psalm 116 verse 7 says this, Return to your rest, my soul. Sometimes you just got to tell your brain, your mind, your inside to just shut up and listen. Return to your rest, my soul. In other words, just, just shut up. The Lord's been good to you. You, Lord, have delivered me from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before the Lord in the land of the living. 
I want you to notice what the psalmist says there in the beginning of that second ver- verse paragraph there. He says, you, Lord, have delivered me from death. If you know Christ as your Savior today, it isn't a case of I hope one day to get to heaven. It is that the Lord has already delivered you from death. The price has been paid. You have been purchased. You now belong to him. There's no doubt whatever to in your mind. And at times when you get anxious, you really need to give yourself a talking to. The Lord has been good to you. You, Lord, have delivered me from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before the Lord, God watching over me in the land of the living. Galatians 3, verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. It is written, cursed is everyone who hung on a pole. That's a picture of the crucifixion. When Jesus died, he bought us back. We have been redeemed. In John chapter 5 and verse 24, Jesus says this, Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged but has crossed from death to life. Now, take a good look at this verse up on their screen there, will you? Very truly, I tell you. So Jesus tell you, I'm not lying. That's good to know, right? Because it's Jesus talking. So Jesus saying, very truly, this is for real. Whoever hears my word, whoever, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. Okay? So whoever... No distinction here. Every single one of us who has trusted Christ, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me, what's the next word? Let's try that again. It's not a trick. Okay, the the next word, believes him who sent me, what's the next word? Has. Not will have, certainly not may have, but has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. When you trusted Christ as your Savior, you received the gift of eternal life, and you crossed over from death to life. God has redeemed us. Then let me just pull this out of that same verse in Psalm 49. God will do what he said. God will do what he said. But God will redeem us from the realm of the dead. He will surely, now notice what's underlined there. He will surely take me to himself. All right, that's kind of put in that way to make it real positive. There's no doubt about this. God will surely take me to himself. Now, when I was in Bible college, um, coming towards the end and coming towards graduation, uh, when we had our our graduation, it was, um, I guess because it was a Bible college, it was more the form of a service. And we did not have a valedictorian speak. Um one of the students was chosen to preach. And uh, they asked me to preach at the graduation when I was finishing Bible college. And it was quite a responsibility. There were a lot of people there and there were a lot of people who'd been in ministry way longer than I had. Actually, everybody there who was pastoring had been in ministry longer than I had because I hadn't been. Um, But it was a great thing. And, And I started to really, you know, so... When they ask me, it's like, okay, what the heck am I going to preach on? Now, that's a good question to direct to God, really. So I'm like, for a few days, I'm just saying, you know, Lord, you know, if you tell me what you want me to do, tell me what you want me to do. And then one morning, I'm reading a passage from the Bible that I'd heard before, but I wasn't very familiar with. And I took this for my message at that graduation. They are the words of Job in Job chapter 19 
And Job says this, Job 19, verse 23. He says, oh, that my words were recorded. <laughs> Little did he know they were. We got them. Oh, that my words were recorded, that they were written on a scroll, that they were inscribed with an iron tool on lead or engraved in rock forever. So Job said, what I'm going to say now, I just wish that like people would be able to see this and read this and know this forever. And what is it? I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand in the earth and after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I am not another, and my heart yearns within me. Job said, this is so huge. I wish everybody could get to hear it. And by God's grace, today we are getting to hear it. He said, here's what I want everybody to know. I know that my Redeemer lives. I love that. I love that. I know my Redeemer lives. Jesus died. He rose again. He went back to heaven. He ever lives in heaven. I know that my Redeemer lives. And I know more than that. I know that when this body's done away with and when this body's kind of breathed his last breath and, and when I leave this body and I'm done with it, I, I know what happens next. I know that with a new body, I'm going to see the Lord. I'm going to see the Lord. This is for me, not somebody else. Well, it is for you too, but you know what I mean? So often in life we think other people get the blessing and other people get the stuff, and Job says, hey, here's what I know. I know my Redeemer lives, and I know that I'm going to see him, and I know that it will be me meeting Jesus. God will do what he said. God can do anything, right? Except. Except. Let me tell you what God can't do. The book of Hebrews tells us it is impossible for God to lie. You know what that means? That means if God said it, it's got to happen. Right? It's as simple as that. It's as simple as that. So, so if, if the promise of God's word is this, God will redeem me from the realm of the dead and will surely take me to himself. You know something? God will take me home. God will take you home. That is the hope we have. That is the reality we face. And then the third thing I want to just talk to you about for a few minutes is this. The end of that verse in Psalm 49 verse 15 says God will take us to himself. There's something to me that was significant about that. It isn't just that God will take us to heaven. It's that God will take us to himself. Is that heaven is the place of eternal relationship with God. God will take us to himself. Heaven's all about God. There are a lot of great descriptions in the Bible about what happens to us when we leave this earth. Uh, and they give us, each of them gives us a different kind of insight. One, one of them speaks about being carried away by angels. That's in Luke 16 and verse 22. It says of one man, then he died, this poor man, and was taken up by the angels. There's a great picture of death. When Jesus was dying, he talked to one, on the, one of the thieves on the cross beside him, and he likened dying as going to paradise. Luke 23, verse 43. Don't worry. Okay, sorry, I got... Don't worry, I will. I was, I was thrown for a moment. Okay, so the thief's asking him if it's really going to be cool, and Jesus said, don't worry, I will. Today you will join me in paradise. He said, Lord, remember me. Jesus said, don't worry, I will. Today you will be with me in paradise. The moment he left this earth, he went to what God had for him. The Bible talks about dying as moving from a tent to a mansion. First Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians 5 
and verse 1. We know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. I can so identify with this one. I've camped twice. I mean tents, not your RVs and Lord knows what else. I've camped twice. I haven't done it since I was in my 20s. That was when I got smart. <laughs> now Holiday Inn Express is as near to camping as I ever want to get. But you know the great thing about those two occasions that I did go camping it was so fabulous to finally pack up that darn tent and to get in a car. I know what lay before me was solid, windproof, rainproof, had hot water, and best of all, my bed. Right? Right? You know, we get so comfortable sometimes and we spend so much time on the comforts of this life, but we need to recognize this. We're actually still just camping out here in life. This is a campsite. That's what this world is. But the day is going to come when God will take us and our tent will be done away with, our human bodies, and we will move into a building from God, an eternal house that He has prepared moving from tent to a mansion. There's another Bible picture for, for death. It's, it's gaining something better even than living. For me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. So here's the Apostle Paul saying, hey, life's good living with Jesus, but even if I die, if I die, it's going to be even better still. It, it talks about leaving darkness for light. Revelation 22, 5. There'll be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. There's a lot of darkness in this earth. Heaven's the place of eternal light. It talks about resting from our labor. Revelation 14 and verse 13. I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor for their deeds will follow them. There's a place of peace. There's a place of rest where turmoil is over, where pain is done with. And that's the place that God said he will take us to. There's a great description in Hebrews. It speaks about leaving for a better country. They were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. And then in Genesis 25, it talks about coming home to see family and friends. Coming home to see family and friends. It's in Genesis 25, verse 8. I skipped that one actually, Lynn. Thanks. Then Abraham breathed his last and died at a good old age, an old man full of years, and he was gathered to his people. You know, the longer we live, the more connections we have in heaven. It's a reality. When Abraham died as a really old man, he had a lot of connections already in heaven, and he was gathered to his people. Heaven is a place of terrific reunion but God but God will take us home but God will take us home I was about in ninth grade I think when a, a friend of mine at school Pete Vickery said to me uh, one week he said hey Roger what are you doing Saturday night I said nothing that I know of he said you want to come to a dance I said, well, I guess. Uh, he said, because my girlfriend's got a friend who's looking for somebody to come to a dance with her. And he said, I don't know what the word was then. Is the word hot still applicable today, or do we use, or do we use something else? Uh, but that was what he was, you know, he was saying. Anyway, that's what he was saying. So I immediately thought, hey, I don't know if she'll want to be there with me, you know. And he said, he said, come on, it's going to be a good time, and uh, you'll have a great time 
and she's really good. So, so I, I, um, I, I talked to my sister-in-law who is like eight years older than me, my oldest brother's wife. I was talking to her during the weekend and I said, I'm going to this dance and I hope it'll be all right. I don't know if she'll like me or not and whatever else. And, and Eileen's the one piece of advice that stuck with me, apart from the fact she made sure I could really do the twist in a way that would be attractive to another person. Um, that was a visual you don't need to go home with, right? Um, but, but she said to me, whatever you do, make sure you get the last dance. Now, in my youthful naivety, I had no idea, and some of you younger people today might have no idea, because from what I see nowadays, dancing is a whole different ball game than it used to be in civilized days. Um, but I, I said, what do you mean? She said, well, if you ask her for the last dance, and she says, yes, that means you can walk her home, and then the relationship might develop. So I was all primed, ready to go. I go to the dance. Here she is, Vivian Brandt. She was gorgeous. Uh, we didn't dance a lot. Uh, we kind of hung out with a group of us a lot and uh, spent the evening there. Um, but she was, I mean, she was a real nice girl. She was fun. It was really good. And, I, and, and then I said to her, um, so I said, hey, hey, can I have the last dance? And she said, uh, no, I've already promised that to somebody. So... I left. I left. I walked home. And I walked home feeling dejected, uh, crushed, inadequate, hurt, whatever you want. I had a rough weekend until Monday when I was at school. Pete Vickery came to me and he said, uh, hey, I didn't know this, but Vivian Brandt's got a boyfriend. And he's really a nasty piece of work. And he's looking for you. And I said, please make sure to tell him I didn't walk her home. <laughs> you know what church is really about? I'll tell you what church is about. Here we are. And most of us have been through experiences in life where we've been crushed. Felt inadequate. Been broken. Been disappointed. But you know what we're doing right now? We're just walking each other home. We're just walking each other home. God's going to take us home. And we're sharing that journey together. And we're inviting other people to come and join us. Say, hey, why don't you come and join us on this journey? Our hope is an eternal one that God will take us home. Dying is not something I relish, but death has no fear for me because I know what's beyond is so unbelievably good that even when God tries to describe it for me in the Bible, I can't even really fully understand that. But I know that God will take me home. I hope you know that today. Those who believe in Christ pass from death to life. And the way you can find eternal hope is to trust Jesus Christ with your life and with your eternity. Let's pray together. And as we pray, if, if you have never yet committed your life to Christ, and if you're here today and say, well, you know, I wish I could be that confident, you can be. Can be. The Bible simply says this. It says, it says, whoever has the Son, the Son of God, has life. If you open your heart to Christ, you receive the gift of eternal life. If you haven't done that before, I want to encourage you to open up your heart to God right now and say, Lord, I trust you. I believe Jesus died in my place. Lord, I receive from you the gift of eternal life. I give my life and my eternity, God to you and for those of you here today for whom the pain of loss is still something very real my prayer is that you find fresh courage and fresh peace in reminding yourself that this life is for a short time but heaven is forever 
and heaven is for real. And it's the place where we meet our loved ones, never to part again. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for opening heaven for us. Amen. Amen. Now, I ran a couple of minutes late, and uh, I never want to pressure anybody, but if you're able to stay for this song, I'd never heard it before a couple of days ago. If you're able to, I want to encourage you to stay for this song because it kind of just finishes up what I've been sharing today. Let's stand and worship together.